The Great Reset, Bon Vigilante is back from New York City for our viewers worldwide. I'm Lisa Abramowitz in for Jonathan Farrow. Markets are readjusting to a new hawkish tilt around the globe with S&P lower by 1.4% headed into the open, poised for a more than 4% decline on the week. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. We begin with the big issue, the global risk route intensifying. The market has been bad. We're very much in flux now. We have weakness across the, across the world. The animal spirits feel crappy. The global world is slowing. Numerous different headwinds, uh, whether it's around growth. Inflation. Foreign inflation is looking sticky. Geopolitical risk, as well as a hawkish Fed. You name it. There's a tremendous number of pressures. The headwinds are too much. There could be further downside. I'm overall bearish on risk. Sentiment and positioning will become so extremely bearish. We're dealing with an uphill battle here. There's been one morning question that everyone's been asking. When does something break and is it right now? Joining us now, New Edge Wells, Cameron Dawson and Troy Gajewski of FS Investment Solution. Cameron, I want to start with you. Are we watching something break? I think so, yes. I mean, if you look at what's going on in the UK this morning, this is EM-like, essentially this trap where they're trying to raise more debt because of this fiscal stimulus and the bond market doesn't like it. We're seeing this surge in yields, which means that the cost of that debt is even higher and we're seeing a collapse in the pound. Now, I think the key difference that we have versus other currency crises and other tightening cycles from the Fed is that, interesting, the Fed still has some of these facilities to keep dollar liquidity available to the market. So we see that with the BOJ. So the BOJ hasn't had to go out and sell treasuries in its currency intervention. They've been able to just be able to use cash instead using these reverse repurchase agreements. So it is a question if some of these facilities can help stave off the worst of a liquidity crisis. But certainly we are seeing the impacts of much higher yields, much tighter policy impact the global economy. Troy, to this point, do the moves to the market right now, to your vantage point, seem disorderly? Yeah, you know, liquidity has gone down pretty substantially across the board. Uh, but w when you step back, I mean, what's going on now is just a galactic mean reversion between, you know, decades of outrageous levels of financial market outperformance driven by lower and lower interest rates, greater and greater money supply. And as that reverses, we continue to suffer from substantial levels of multiple compression, which most of this year has been defined by. And as yields push higher, because the Fed is basically saying they're, they're willing to risk recession in order to curb inflationary pressures in the labor market. So the stronger the labor market does, the harder they're going to push. So yes, markets have unfortunately gotten disorderly. Um, and we continue to be in this multiple compression and higher nominal and real yield story. And right now, it seems like there's no place to hide, as we've been saying all morning, except for the dollar. WTI crude just falling below $80 a barrel for the first time going back to January. Bank of America's Michael Hartnett was weighing in on the recent bond, bond route, uh, writing, quote, the great bear market in bonds thus far is a doozy. Losses on course for worst since 1949, 1931, and 1920. The bond crash threatens credit events and liquidations of the world's most crowded trades. True capitulation is when investors sell what they love and own. Cameron, you talked about how it feels like something is breaking. Do you expect margin calls? Do you expect some kind of trigger to force selling that we have not seen in instruments like credit. Yeah, I think that is an important point. And if I think if we focus on the on the retail investor, we have been seeing them taking margin debt down fairly significantly over the past few months in this route. But it hasn't reached the kinds of levels that we typically see in big bear markets, which means that that investor hasn't thrown in the towel. So margin calls in that area likely continue to mount as we see losses pressure them. And we also will likely see equity allocations continue to move lower for those retail accounts. So they're still remaining at about 65 percent. Usually in big bear markets, we've seen them go as low as 40, 45 percent. So I think that we really still haven't seen that true 
breadth of capitulation yet. If you look at something like put calls, even today, they have not spiked back up to the June lows yet. And so it's likely that we still need to see that big buying flush moment before we see the end of end of this weakness. And Troy, do you agree with that? Are you waiting? Are you sitting out and not buying? Yeah, I think right now it's the same message we've had since the start of the year is that, you know, the fortunate thing about this bear market versus the global financial crisis or 2002, and this has many similarities to 2002, is alternatives have been democratized. And, you know, rolling up the capital structure in the senior secured commercial real estate debt, embracing daily liquid 40 act multi-strategy funds, that's where you have a chance to still make a reasonable return mid to low high single digits without the downside pressure. And to Cameron's point, it's really interesting. You know, retail has been hanging in there relatively strongly on the ownership side of equities. And when that finally flushes, that will probably lead to a viable bottom. But it's going to be much harder to identify a viable bottom now because the Fed is not going to pivot anytime soon. So even when we bottom out, we might be in a choppy, sloppy mess for several years or at least several quarters before you can buy risk assets with a high level of conviction. Another way to say the Fed put is dead. Stocks set to extend their weekly declines with yields surging to fresh multi-year highs. Evercore weighing in on the outlook following Chair Powell's news conference writing, quote, we see this new even higher for longer rate path is associated with a substantially greater, a highly higher likelihood of a harder landing. And so not just unambiguously hawkish, but unambiguously bad for risk. We are certainly see that play out in the market today. Taylor Riggs of Bloomberg joining us with more. Taylor. Lisa, let's talk about how bad it is for risk. Take a look at the stock 600, of course, as we've been really focused on UK and Europe this morning. Interesting, Goldman Sachs putting out an August survey. According to the median strategist there, it's not going to be pretty from here to the end of the year with the stock 600 on average at about 427. The median viewpoint of about a 418 on price. As you can see there, about a 391 that doesn't really put you much higher really here for the rest of the year. Let's bring it back to the U.S. as we're counting you down, of course, to the opening and then the closing bell of the day and of the week. And it looks like it really is going to be set up for another sort of 3% losses. As you can see there, you're looking at the ninth time that we've had 3% losses this year, the fourth time in five weeks. And Lisa, you know the story. It is bond yields. I'm taking a look at today what would be a 12th straight day of yields rising on the two-year yield. That is the longest streak in data that we have going back to 1976 and really matching some of the long streaks that we had in the 80s, particularly 83 under Mr. Volcker. There's a question, Taylor, and thank you, whether we're actually just witnessing the collapse of a, uh, of a, bu a bubble in sovereign debt. Barclays warning that the Fed's commitment to taming inflation bodes poorly for equities, writing, quote, no pain, no gain was the message from the Fed in case anyone still has doubt about its resolve to fight inflation and pass downturns. A rate cut was a precondition for equities to start a new bull market. We are not there yet. And stay cautious with a defensive tilt. Still with us, Cameron Dawson and Troy Gajewski. This really echoes, Troy, what you were just saying. So do you just basically hold cash, right? I mean, this has basically been the big question and the reason why the dollar has been so dominant and painfully so for so many nations. Yeah, so if you look at in our tactical asset allocation franchise, we've really been focused on the front end of the yield curve. As yields have gone higher, you can obviously pick up more income there. If you want to reach for even additional yield, uh, that's principally floating rate exposures, you know, senior secured commercial real estate, private loans that are very economically resilient is a place to be. Uh, but yeah, play in defense has been critical this year. Protecting capital in this very painful bear market is the way to go. And you certainly don't want to reach for excessive levels of risk. So whether it's a daily liquid multi-strategy solution, senior secured debt, or the front end of the U.S. yield curve, those are some of the places you can hang, hang, hide out in a very challenging market. Cameron, what about you? Where are you hiding or recommending that investors who might have a longer term horizon really focus? Yeah, we think it is still the time to be defensive, but we do not want to be defensive just with your classical defensive sectors like utilities and staples because we see two big issues with those sectors. The first one is that they're really expensive. They're trading at 20% premiums to the market. But the other one is that they typically only have this upside episodic volatility, meaning they might outperform in periods where everybody is seeking safety and everybody is scared. But typically on the other side, they 
give back all of their gains. So for longer term investors, we prefer to get defensiveness through healthcare. It trades at a 10% discount to the market. And we think that there's better secular trends. And so it gives you a bit of that defensiveness in an uncertain environment, mostly an uncertain economic environment like we have today. But you have less of the risk of giving back all of the, that relative performance on the other side once we go back into a recovery. This seems to be an increasing consensus about healthcare, with a number of people seeing this as a great place to hide. Former Goldman Sachs partner Abby Joseph Cohen weighed in yesterday on the recent volatility in markets. Take a listen. The equity market didn't know what to do. Um, first it was up, then it was down, then it was up, then it was down big time. Uh, there was really erratic behavior because to your point, Lisa, uh, equity investors are really confused because there is this yin yang between inflation and higher yields versus will the economy and earnings continue to grow. So earnings very much front and focus, Troy. And from your perspective, how much are you watching the upcoming earnings season for a guide in addition to a flush out in retail sentiment? Yeah, and that the problem is going to be more about forward earnings going forward as opposed to multiple compression. We think we're probably, you know, 60 to 80 percent done with multiple compression. But as the Fed continue to jam on the brakes, risk of recession has gone up dramatically. So we do expect much weaker earnings guidance in Q3 and Q4. And, and ultimately, you know, recessions, earnings go down, not up. And most of the multiples compression we're talking about is based on earnings that are still going to grow. So that's going to be a key indicator. And, you know, one other thing I'd say, Lisa, to your point, as opposed to just being short defensives, um, as we have a small position like that in our multi-strategy versus cyclicals, which is positively convex as well as growth, um, is right now, if you look at the transition in the housing market, if you focus on interest-only securities, they actually benefit when home prices either flatline or go down. So that's another uh, exposure that you can focus on to earn really attractive carry that's not only non-correlated to broader markets, but also negatively correlated to the housing market, which is still most investors' principal uh, asset, particularly uh, for individual investors. You know it's a defensive market when we're doing Bond Math Friday, but you are absolutely correct that it's something to dig into in terms of exploring different nuances and dislocations. Cameron Dawson and Troy Gaeski, both of you are sticking with us. Joining us now with a look at the stocks moving ahead of the opening bell, here's our own Abigail Doolittle. Abby. Hey, Lisa. Well, it is certainly a very bearish environment. I think it's starting to feel that way too that there's no way out nowhere to turn the S&P 500 less than 2 percent above its uh, June lows we are off the lows today but nonetheless pretty big declines for some of the bigger movers Apple down 1.2 percent bond yields this week it's incredible you all talking about bonds this uh, you know this morning and yields shooting higher up 25 basis points for both the two and the 10 year yield that's pressing on big tech in general Apple a piece of it oil, as you were just mentioning, Lisa, back below $80 per barrel WTI crude for the first time since January, breaking down on every level. Of course, earlier this year, we had that parabolic move that seemed unsustainable. Well, that's proving true. And it's really weighing on both ExxonMobil and Occidental Petroleum, both of those stocks down 3.5 percent or more. And then finally, FedEx, a piece of this uh, bearishness, of course, last week pre-announcing to the downside in a big way, one of the many big companies doing that. Yesterday, the new CEO outlaying a plan to cut costs costs and raise prices. Initially, investors had been uh, impressed by it, but not so much, Lisa. This It seems as though all this has much more to go. Abigail Doolittle, thank you so much. Coming up, we'll take a focus on the United Kingdom government, which just unveiled the biggest tax cuts since 1972. I'm not going to cut the additional rate of tax today, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to abolish it altogether. This means that we will have one of the most competitive and pro-growth income tax systems in the world. The response in markets has been fierce. Guilt plunging, the pound touching the lowest level in 37 years. We'll discuss that more coming up and the ramifications for global markets. This is Bloomberg. Next year's planned increase in corporation tax will be cancelled. We are cutting stamp duty. I'm not going to cut the additional rate of tax today, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to abolish it altogether. This means that we will have one of the most competitive and pro-growth income tax systems in the world. The markets uh, uh, react as they will, but the, gro but the growth plan, the growth plan will uh, very soon show, show that we're on the right course. 
The markets will react as they will. The UK's Chancellor of the Exchequer announcing Britain's most extensive package of tax cuts going back to 1972. The goal is to stimulate the economy. The fiscal measures adding fuel to the inflation fire. The sell-off has been fierce, both in UK government bonds as well as the pound, which just touched its lowest level since 1985. The team is here covering all of this. Lizzie Burden and Guy Johnson, both of them from London. Lizzie, you've been covering it all morning. What exactly has Liz Truss's administration put out there and why is it considered so radical? Well, it's so radical because it's a huge economic and political gamble. The official fiscal watchdog, the Office for Budget Responsibility, hasn't been given a chance to cost these measures, even though, as you say, it's the biggest raft of tax cuts since 1972. Uh, and it's at a time when interest rates are rising, so borrowing's more expensive. Clearly, markets reckon that it's going to add to inflation because now traders are pricing for 100 basis points racist rate hike from the Bank of England in November. And the Institute for Fiscal Studies has said that while it will certainly add for bot to borrowing, it doesn't necessarily add significantly to growth. But aside from the economics, it's also a political gamble. We're two years away from an election in the UK. We're in the middle of a cost of living crisis. Voters themselves didn't choose Liz Truss. The Tory party members did. And yet, according to Resolution Foundation analysis, if you earn more than a million pounds a year in the UK, you're going to get a £55,000 tax cut next year twice what the average earner here brings home in a year. So frankly, our audience, because of these tax cuts at the top end, they've got a lot richer. But markets are showing their disapproval. The tank, the pounds tanked, uh, so have bonds. And really, Kwarteng needs to care. You heard him say there that markets will do what they'll do. But if he doesn't mind the markets, the price of borrowing is only going to increase. Lizzie, that seems to be the concern, Guy. Can you talk a little bit more about that, especially as we're hearing now? Former Treasury Secretary Lawrence Summers, uh, Larry Summers, was on the, uh, the television with David Weston talking about the potential for the pound to fall through parity. How often do we hear about that and how the U.K. risks becoming a submerging market? Guy, how much are you hearing this? Let me quantify what Larry Summers just has been talking about. It is now a one in seven chance that we get to parity by year end. That is how the market is now pricing it, Lisa. Uh, it was only a few months ago a one in a hundred chance. Uh, the odds have narrowed significantly that we will fall through parity uh, on the cable rate. The market is now asking itself a very simple, simple question. Why should I invest, give money to, lend money to the UK? And that is a very precarious position to be in when you run the kind of twin deficits that the UK runs. Uh, as the, uh, the former governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, used to talk about, we rely on the kindness of strangers. Uh, are we going to see that continuing? Uh, and I think today maybe is a sense that, that the kindness of strangers is wearing thin. Uh, the market is clearly uh, pricing a huge challenge now, Lisa, for the Bank of England. How does it react to this? These higher rates that are being priced into the gilt market are going to have a detrimental impact on growth. How does the Bank of England react to that is now a key question. The market is now pricing 100 basis points at the next meeting. But will the bank actually deliver upon that, Lisa? Guy Johnson, uh, Lizzie Burden, both of you, thank you so much. From London, Cameron Dawson and Troy Gajewski still with us. Troy, from your perspective, how much does this concern you, what you see over in the United Kingdom as a template of what's to come and also for that nation? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, it's really stunning to watch some of these fiscally irresponsible policies coming out at a time where, you know, you have a clearly outrageous levels of inflation and how that, that's going to help cure that. It just puts so much more of a burden you know, on the BOE to, to curb inflation when you're having that level of fiscal stimulus at an inopportune time. But I think the broader point, it's really interesting, Lisa, like we were talking about before, the, the main show now in markets is still the Fed, higher rates, as well as recession risk in the U.S. But if it weren't for that, we'd be talking about the German economic uh, or the German economy basically collapsing, the industrial economy collapsing. There's a meaningful risk that China devalues their currency coming out of Xi's coronation. So we have all these percolating risks internationally that we don't focus on as much as we typically would because there's been so much drama around the Fed and higher rates as well as recession risk going up. So it's a very dangerous world, certainly much trickier than we even thought coming into the year. And again, protect capital is paramount in this environment. Don't be a hero. There will be a time to take more risk. But fortunately, there are democratized alternative strategies that can help guide you through this challenging period. 
Cameron, from your perspective, Troy was touching on the fiscal uh, response to some of the pain that a lot of nations are feeling. How do you factor that in, this sort of push-pull where fiscal and monetary can't seem to cooperate in the same way that they have and seem to be working against each other? Yeah, they, they they certainly are offsetting each other. That's what the what the BOE is having to do, and that's why the market's pricing in that hundred basis point rate increase for the UK simply because they have to offset the impact from the higher fiscal policy. And so what this does is it constrains governments to be able to react to a potential recession. And recessions do look likely in the UK, in the EU, and likely in the US because of the degree of tightening by the Fed. So we're looking at borrowers of floating rate debt, looking at things like private credit, private equity, real estate, and asking the question, does the move from 0.2% in LIBOR last year all the way up to 4.7% today impact those borrowers yeah. and possibly create credit issues that could really slow growth? Cameron Dawson, Troy Gajewski, both of you, thank you so much for joining on this incredible volatile um, day. Uh, coming up, the morning calls and later, RIP Tina. Truist's Keith Lerner seeing competition against stocks back in the picture amid sharp rises in rates. Keith joining us at the opening bell. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Countdown to the open. I'm Lisa Abramowitz in for Jonathan Farrell, clawing back some of the losses from earlier in the morning. The S&P down nine tenths of a percent. Uh, the Nasdaq down a similar amount. Still, though, in bonds, the, the really the trajectory is for yields to be higher, price lower. The two-year yield 4.13 percent. Hard to get your hands around that, considering we started the year at about 70 basis points. Time now for a look at our morning calls. A look at some of the analyst recommendations on Wall Street this morning. First up, BMO downgrading or upgrading, if excuse me. A Dominoes to outperform, seeing an attractive risk reward following recent declines. Next up, Wells Fargo downgrading Ally Financial to equal weight, expecting limited upside due to the uncertain macro environment. And finally, Jefferies cutting its Nike price target down to $130, highlighting weaker sales and web traffic out of Europe and Asia. Taking a look at oil prices, and this is something that people are watching. Crude, WTI, falling through 80 for the first time since January. Coming up, risk assets extending their declines. Truist co-chief investment officer Keith Lerner recommending investors get defensive and move up in quality. That conversation coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Down to the open. I'm Lisa Abramowitz in for Jonathan Farrow, just seconds away from the open of trading. We're calling back some of the losses from earlier this morning with the S&P and uh, NASDAQ down about 1%. The shift has really come in the bond market when you take a look at 10 year Treasury yields. They actually were higher earlier in the session. Now they are lower, 3.70%. This perhaps is a flight to haven, uh, havens, and it could be into duration. That's given a little bit of support to the equity markets and you are seeing the euro continue to decline 97 handle just shocking to see some of the uh, reversals of the past few decades and crude falling below $80 a barrel on the WTI index we're looking right now at $79.40 joining us now with a look at the stocks moving ahead at the opening at the opening bell I should say here is Abigail Doolittle Hey, Lisa. Well, anyway, you slice and dice it, it's bearish. We might be off the lows a little bit, but we are looking at stocks down for a fifth out of the last six weeks. Really pretty uh, bad near that June low. The question will be, will that low hold? Right now, some big movers to the downside. NVIDIA down 1.2%. Now, the stock's down 40% from its all-time high. Morgan Stanley right now saying an even greater pervasive correction is going to hit the chip. So NVIDIA, a big bellwether there. JP Morgan Chase, even with uh, yields coming in a little bit at this point, uh, it is down on that. But that two-year yield higher. Uh, so despite the action in yields, that conundrum we've seen all year. Chevron, like other oil giants, down, down 3.2 percent as oil WTI crude breaches that $80 mark at its lowest level since January. And then finally, any metal that I look at here, Lisa, on the Bloomberg terminal, whether it is uh, palladium, platinum, gold, uh, a 
along with copper, they are down. That means Freeport MacMoran is also down. That metal and miner, rough day, rough week, rough year. Abigail, thank you so much. Tech stocks extending their declines as rates keep moving higher. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow here in the studio with us. Ed. Yeah, morning. We're down a percentage point on the NASDAQ 100 and on the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index. Notable declines in most of the mega caps dragging down the NASDAQ 100. We're heading for a second consecutive weekly decline on the NASDAQ 100. Fifth decline in six weeks. But I'll give you a little bit of hope because it's Friday and I like to be an optimist. We're not seeing the declines that we saw last week following that CPI print. This is the story, right? Bring up the this terminal chart, you look at the push higher in real yields, the decline in the NASDAQ 100. There's a portion of the market that would say valuations have come down. Now might be an opportunity to buy, but it's hard to call a bottom when you continue to, continue to see those real yields push higher. There is also a pocket of pain in the market, and that is semiconductors. Semiconductor declines on a year-to-date basis, far outweighing that of the NASDAQ 100. But it's also where we see the majority of earnings revisions. And as we move away from this higher rates narrative to one about global growth, it's really the pain in the semiconductor industry that's to come that the market seems to be worrying about. Happy Friday. <laughs> Ed Ludlow, thanks for the note of, I guess, optimism. What started as a mild sell-off this month has morphed into a deepening interest rate spurred route, wiping out virtually all of the ga uh, gains that we saw in equities this summer. Kaylee Lines joining us back for more fun. Kaylee. <laughs> well, Lisa, I'm not really sure it is a happy Friday, at least if you're invested in a lot of these different assets. And it really hasn't been a happy year. It seems really the only place anywhere wa anyone wants to go is cash or to the U.S. dollar, because certainly in the bond market, Ed was just talking about that higher rate story. We have to put this move in context. The move in yields marking a significant break of the long-term downtrend we have seen in rates. And when I say long-term, I mean 35 years. We have finally seen a shifting of the tides, though, as yields move up, yields up, price down. It seems like the great bond bull market is now firmly a bear one. And of course, those higher rates, as Ed was saying, have taken their toll on equities. He was talking about kind of tech as a basket, but imagine being a profitless tech company in this kind of environment. They have taken the most brutal punishment of all, a basket of those stocks down 54.5% on a year-to-date basis that well outpaces the losses we have seen for the NASDAQ 100 or S&P 500, though of course those losses also are substantial. And it used to be amid all that carnage in stocks and bonds, you could at least count on some insulation in the commodity market. But as as the narrative shifts from one of constrained supply to now weakening demand, that has changed too. Copper, for example, down 30 percent over the last five months. Copper prices down once again today, along with oil prices. You mentioned it earlier. We're looking at a 79 handle on WTI. So you can't buy the commodity market. You can't buy the bond market. You can't buy the stock market. I guess that leaves you with the U.S. dollar and cash. Lisa. Kelly Lines, thank you. I guess it's very happy, happy day. <laughs> Goldman Sachs slashing its S&P 500 year-end target to 3,600 from 4,300. Strategist David Costin writing, quote, the expected path of interest rates is now higher than we previously assumed, which tilts the distribution of equity market outcomes below our prior forecast. It seems to be a theme across Wall Street. Bloomberg's Taylor Riggs joining us now with more. Taylor. And Lisa, those higher rates are impacting not only the price, but also sort of those PE multiples. Let's walk through the math that Goldman does when they migrate downward to about a 3,600 on the year on price target from a previous estimate of 43. The higher discount rate, you know the math, the higher the input, the lower at the present value. It also means you migrate downward to about a 15 times on a PE uh, basis and a ratio relative to 18, which it was before. The economist, David um, Costin, of course, the equity strategist, saying that the economists are now looking for 75 in November, 50 in December, 25 next February. Peak rates means lower price. And you've really seen sort of the migration downward as we're rethinking the path of this Federal Reserve and really here the higher the interest rate. So we've gone from about a 48 earlier in the spring, a 46, 44 this summer, and then alas, about a 4,300 is where we are now when we think about those year-end price targets. Public agrees, and this is sort of a similar point that Kaylee was making as well. If you want to go into a one-year CD, you're getting three, four percent king dollar. So why not? Maybe a risk-free cash is king. Taylor, thank you so much. Keith Lerner of Truist expecting markets to remain volatile, writing, quote, we expect this choppy and challenging market to continue. Recession probabilities are very high. Even if inflation slows, the scar tissue left behind at the Fed due to the inflation challenges of the past year should not be understated. Keith Lerner, I am so happy to say, is joining us right now. Keith, how much, especially as we look at King Dollar, as we look at real yields on 10-year treasuries climbing to the highest going back to 2011, 
How much can you really lean against that trade versus just pile in with the rest of the investors? Well, first, uh, great to be with you, Lisa. It's uh, it has been an extraordinarily a uh, challenging market. You know, our view since early this year is, you know, we started to become more cautious up in quality really since February. And, uh, you know, before Powell's speech, uh, you know, the market was around 4,200. And we, we thought the market was pricing in this kind of soft landing, which we thought was really um, it didn't make a lot of sense. So, you know, at this point, though, I will say I know everyone's negative. The, 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 the numbers today, the futures are looking uh, very negative. You know, we're down 13 percent in about a month. So I don't know that it makes sense to become more negative here. We still are uh, positioned for more of that choppy, challenging market. But again, we're down 13 percent. Markets don't move in a straight line. Sentiment is becoming a bit one sided. And what we've seen this morning so far is, you know, as rates have come in just kind of a little bit, you know, seen a little bit of stabilization uh, in the overall market. And we do think you know, that there is now value in fixed income. And, you know, for the last decade, that's not something we could really say. So it may overshoot, but it's really about time frame, especially for folks that have, you know, two, three, four year time frame. Uh, the fixed income side in particular is starting to look a lot more interesting. Are you buying anything today, Keith? You know, we're not day traders per se. So, um, you know, again, we, uh, we, we have changed uh, when the market was on 4,200, 4,300. We actually re reduced equities. I think what we're looking at more right now is, is the opportunity in fixed income. So we're not doing anything per se today. But I do think the, the fixed income side is becoming more attractive. And again, look at the two-year yield. Uh, you just talked about it before, above 4%. You look at the year-over-year -year change in the two-year. That, that now exceeds the change we saw in 1995. And with all this global uh, bank tightening, rates can, may continue to overshoot. But ultimately, that's going to weigh on economic growth. And we think as you look into next year, that's going to cap the upside in rates, even though we are having... And overshoot. You know, Lisa, what's interesting is these moves in these markets would tend, which historically we would expect to happen over years or happening over, you know, weeks now, or even sometimes it feels like days. So things are just moving a lot quicker today. So Michael Hartnett over to Bank of America weighed in on the bond crash that we've seen over the past six or six or nine months, writing, quote, inflation rates, recession shocks are not over. Plus bond crash in recent weeks means highs in credit spreads, lows in stocks are not yet in. Investor sentiment unquestionably worse since global financial crisis and possibly worse than even then. From your vantage point, when you talk about about fixed income, how isolated is that to treasuries and not necessarily to credit? Yeah, we would certainly be focused on high quality kind of government uh, type securities because if we do go into a recession, high yield spreads, which have hung in there actually relatively well, uh, are not priced for a recession. So we would stick up. You don't need to take the, if you're getting a 4% yield in the two year or something you know, approaching 375 in the 10, um, we don't think it makes sense to take that credit risk. And I think this sharp move in rates, how quickly ha it has moved up, uh, really increases the, the risk of, prob uh, of recession. And in that environment, you don't want to take on a lot of credit risk in, in our view. How much is your view on the equity stance going to be dictated by earnings? Is that really relevant or is this a real macro story at this point driven by rates? No, it, it is relevant. I mean, the earnings have held there, also have held in you know, relatively well. And I think what happens right now is, if you look at the overall S&P, the, the, the P.E. is about 16. If you look at the equal weighted S&P, which is the average stock, it's about 13. But that's so on. That's probably um, doesn't take into account that earnings still need to come down. So stocks have revalued lower. They're cheaper, especially someone looking at, you know, five, you know, three, five, ten years out. But they're not at a, like a compelling uh, valuation relative to this, you know, really challenging macro environment. The other thing that's interesting is, you know, one thing we look at is this equity risk premium, right? The earnings yield relative to the uh, the Treasury market. And even though stocks have come down since yields have moved up so quickly, the relative appeal of stocks is not um, as attractive, actually has moved down in, in the way we look at this as far as what, what that means for forward returns. So, again, I think it's where, where we are overall is, you know, still be somewhat defensive sector positions, staples, utilities, healthcare. I mean, we still like energy. But, you know, I think there will be an opportunity to become more on offense. We're not there yet. But the last thing I'll say, Lisa, just short term again, we're down 13 percent. You know, I don't want to just, you know, pile on to all the negativity on a short term basis when we're down 13 percent in a month. That's a pretty extreme move that we've seen already 
you know, and we've seen that, it, you know, once you hit a low, the, the, a short term rally can move pretty quickly the other way as well. I appreciate that because it's, it's so easy to get caught up in a certain hysteria and the emotional aspect of the bear market, as Julian Emanuel put it. Before we let you go, though, or before we move on, I do want to get your view when it comes to earnings, how the pound, how some of these currency moves, how the fate of the rest of the ex US world is dealing with both the inflationary aspect as well as. The difficulty in fighting a reverse currency war, how much are you looking at earnings of U.S. companies getting detrimentally affected by a European region and the United Kingdom absolutely flat on its back? No, it, it, it's, it's certainly one of the big risks to earnings, and that's why we think they have to be reset lower. But I will say, if you look globally, we, we've been longstanding uh, bulls on the U.S. market. We call it the big blue chip country. And you think about the fragility of these overseas markets already before this. You had economies that were almost growing, um, you know, less than 1% with this inflation, with interest rates, with the energy problems. Uh, we have uh, in our guidance portfolios, we have zero allocation to emerging markets, and we're about a third of the allocation to international developed markets. That's not a new stance for us. That's our position uh, for some time now. So we would still say, even though there's some concerns on the multinationals, stick with the U.S., the big blue chip country, stick up in quality and have more, the sector, uh, have more defensive sector position within that allocation. Keith Lerner, you're going to be sticking with us. Coming up, bond yields surging as central banks around the world hike rates. That conversation still ahead as we pair some of the losses from earlier, uh, but still deeply negative after an already negative week. Amazing to think we're down 13 percent in just a couple of weeks as we reassess the commitment of this Federal Reserve to hike rates. This is Bloomberg. We think at a minimum, the Treasury curve will be at about four and a half percent. That's a 12 percent yield with credit spread and where um, the Treasury curve is. That's substantially above the eight and a half percent now. So there's a lot of impatience in the market to take advantage of the repricing. We're not even in the recession yet. Let's wait till we get there. That was Bob Michael with some pretty scathing comments for the prospects for credit returns over the near term. Global bond yields surging amid a global rate hike frenzy this week. Central banks around the world trying to crush inflation, even as they run the mounting risk of driving their economies into recession. This has been the, the issue of rising into weakness. Right now, we are getting uh, some data, both Michael McKee and Kaylee Lyons both joining us to give us more perspective. Mike, some data just crossing uh, having to do with industry. What's the latest there? Well, these are the S&P Global PMIs. Uh, they are released around the world today. And in the U.S., a bit of a surprise. Manufacturing rises, 51.8 from 51.5. Don't know the reason for that, but it is a bit of good news, and it remains above the 50 level, which signifies expansion. Services, however, dropped to 49.2. That's an increase, actually, from 43.7. The week before, the month before, but it is still below contractionary territory, and the composite at 49.3 is uh, also up from 44.6 uh, last month. Uh, so a little bit of improvement in the U.S. economy. It's kind of hard to relate to the rest of the world when you look at the others that came out today: Germany, France, the eurozone, and U.K. France had uh, decent services numbers, but a lot of 40s on those boards, and it does show that Europe is pretty much headed into, if not already, in recession. Interesting comment today, um, and maybe uh, Kaylee has more on this, from uh, the folks at BMO saying that uh, the data don't matter anymore. It's really what the Fed and the other central banks say that uh, people care about because it's all about inflation. Well, Michael McKee, thank you. And we are seeing right now uh, a little bit of a response. Yields going even higher in the two year. And Keely, this kind of speaks to what we've been seeing and speaks to the strength of the U.S. being bad news, at least when it comes to short term rates. Yeah, and that's definitely a story in the rates market. It's one in foreign exchange as well, because I would argue how much do even other central banks matter as long as the Federal Reserve is hiking and keeping the dollar strong and everything else weak. But on the subject of the bond market, I have said this multiple times today. I keep questioning myself as to whether I'm 
actually looking at an intraday chart because some of the intraday moves are absolutely wild. We are up 39, call it 40 basis points on the two year gilt yield in the UK, 47 basis points on the five year after we got the outlines of the fiscal policy plans of the new government and the borrowing that is going to have to come with it. That, of course, is the standout. But this is a global story. The two year yield in Italy up 15 basis points to 2956. Uh, and of course, you're seeing it in treasuries, as you said, Lisa. And while I say I can be astounded by an intraday chart, I also can be astounded by a longer term one because taking a look here at a year to date chart of the two year treasury yield, we're up 340 basis points on the year and 125 basis points of that has come just since the beginning of August. The pace of these moves is remarkable as we rush to reprice our expectations of a hawkish Federal Reserve and really central banks across the board. Of course, what that all adds up to is a bear market in bonds. The Bloomberg Global Aggregate Index is down 20 percent from its peak. I'm sure there are a lot of investors out there that could use a big bear hug right now. <laughs> Kaylee Lines, thank you. So with us, we're so Lucky to have Keith Lerner. Keith, thank you so much for your patience. As we watch real yields continue to climb, as we see central banks hiking into weakness, is there certain are there certain thresholds you're looking for to determine how to shift or that perhaps the time is to perhaps get a little more aggressive? Sure. I mean, you know, the first thing is we have seen sentiment, what people are saying, being pretty bearish, but we haven't seen that follow through as much in some of the technical indicators like the protocol ratios. Um, the equity flows this year have actually been pretty benign. I think a little bit of, of uh, more aggressive on that side would be helpful. I mean, you certainly want to see also maybe a shift under the surface where you start to see some of these cyclical areas of the market show stabilization. And of course, you, you, need, to, you need to see interest rates stabilize. I mean, that will be you know, all important. But let's also put some context about where we're at, because again, we're, you know, we are more, um, you know, on the, on the cautious side, you know, when looking at, the, let's say, the next, you know, six months or so. But, you know, from a long term investor's perspective is for the first time in a decade, you actually are getting compensated for fixed income, right? So in a balanced portfolio where everyone was, you know, trying to having to take more risk because there was no return, when you look out, you're actually going to get better compensated. So that's a good, even though we have to take this uh, short term pain. So I just think, you know, in days like this and a lot of, you know, the viewers that aren't just investing for the next several months who are investing longer, it just makes sense to have that uh, back up. The other thing is we look back historically and said, hey, you know, if you bought the market when you're down 20 percent, you know, since the 1950s, you know, three years later, you're up, you know, with strong gains the majority of the time. But that didn't preclude some short term weakness over the next year, especially if you go into recession, which is still our base case. So I think that is helpful. And then lastly, maybe, you know, around recessions, the market, the median declines about 24 percent. The average is about 30 percent. So we're, we're over 20 percent already. It doesn't mean you can't overshoot. But I think, you know, it's also helpful to have some context, you know, with the overall picture. When you talk longer term, three year, five year, 10 year yeah. horizon, yep. how much are you discounting some of the theories out there right now that we're going to have a prolonged lost decade of earnings or a lost decade of returns in stocks? Well, I think what's different going forward is, uh, one, we do think returns will be somewhat higher, so we don't think it's going to be a lost decade. But I do think with the scar tissue mentioned in the beginning of the sh of the show, our view is that the Fed has scar tissue, and the, the next decade it will likely be a lot different than the last decade. It's not just a buy and hold market. You have to be somewhat more tactical. Part of the reason why we had, we had all these V-shaped recoveries in the market is because the Fed was on perpetual call. They didn't have to worry about inflation in the last decade. Remember back in 2008, 2009, all the money printing, the, everyone kept saying, oh, there's going to be inflation, there's going to be inflation. No inflation showed up. Well, this time is different. So what that means going forward is that not only is the Fed staying higher for longer, when they eventually do ease, they're likely go, um, to be not aggressive and they're likely to pull back sooner. So that means to us a more volatile and tactical uh, environment. And, and that's what we've been doing this year. We've been made over five tactical shifts in some of the, the, the portfolios we manage directly, um, these big asset allocation portfolios. So I think the mindset has to change a bit. Uh, and that's a wake up call. Keith Lerner, thank you so much for taking the time on a pretty active day, to say the least. Coming up, the market moving events that you need to be watching. That's next in our trading diary. Uh, about 24 minutes here into the open. The red's still there. People still risk off as we take a look at the prospect of uh, perhaps a more aggressive Fed deepening losses. The Nasdaq down 1.7%. This is Bloomberg.
Bloomberg, the open about half hour into the trading day and the pain is just getting deeper. The S&P down nearly 1.7 percent as people reconsider the Fed's rate path and what that will unearth onto this particular economy. We're also seeing yields higher on the front end. Time now for the trading diary. What you need to be watching through the next week, Italian elections on Sunday. Ton of Fed speak on the calendar, including President Bostic, Mester Evans, Daly and Chair Powell on, on Tuesday. ECB President Lagarde on Wednesday, GDP and initial jobless claims in the U.S. on Thursday. More Fed speak from Williams and Brainerd to wrap the week. This was Countdown to the Open. This is Bloomberg.